the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning at the 8 o'clock, something jumped out to me as Frank Stallingworth was reading the reading from Hebrews. And it was this line that Rahab came, received the spies in peace. I thought, darn, I wish I had written about that in my sermon. <laughs> there is a perfect example I was looking for when we talk about the peace that Christ brings, not the one that we expect. And so what did Rahab do? Like a real quick overview. She left these spies in Jericho. She did the work of the Lord. She transgressed against her society in multiple ways already. And then she was faithful to the voice of God in her life. She risked everything to move the plot forward. That's peace. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? So what is he talking about? I already gave you a little bit of a hint. But have you ever said something and had everyone around you mistake your tone? And then if you're like, and then if you're like me, you try to fix it. It just gets worse. <laughs> and you just move on, right? Um, the same thing happens when we read scripture. We don't always catch the tone of what is being said. We can mistake what is descriptive for something that is prescriptive. In other words, when read closely, is Jesus prescribing division and strife, i.e. actively planning on bringing it, like a doctor writing out the note, this is what you need to do, this is what's going to happen? Or is he just describing how things will look throughout the ages as each generation of the church tackles the issues that plague them in their time, not only out in the world, but within the church? Because in case you haven't noticed... We have not managed this division problem yet. As some see it, ever-increasing strife and division points to the coming time of judgment, which will be a horrendous and destructive experience for the whole world. According to this view, Jesus is prescribing this for us. He's prescribing pain and suffering, that they are his will for those who don't repent and turn to the Lord. Well, that kind of thinking has permeated our culture in both secular and religious circles. Though I'm relieved to tell you this is a relatively new minority perspective in the history of church and one that will never be made doctrine, especially not in the Anglican communion. Because of this misreading of scripture and its influence on our world, what was that book? Um, oh, that series that was so popular where all the people got sucked up in the rapture, left behind, right? <laughs> Best time, you know, bestseller on the New York book list over and over again. Because of that misreading and those types of books, let's be honest, we tend to shy away from readings like the ones we heard today. But when we just focus on the parts of Scripture that make us feel good, we're less able to develop a mature understanding of and appreciation for God's plan of salvation. So what I hope to convey today is that this reading we had is descriptive of what happens when people begin to live their lives according to the gospel. Because when we draw closer to Jesus, we can no longer tolerate living comfortably while our neighbors suffer. Being a follower of Jesus does not allow for that, and speaking up for the poor and the marginalized is often disruptive. But it's not creating a new division. It's just exposing the one that's already there. As a piece of Christ, it's neither like marshmallow candy, and it is not this coming reign of terror. We don't need to be afraid of one word of Scripture. The peace of Christ is active, and it can be discomforting to those who would rather just go with the flow and keep things the way they were. Jesus' peace disrupts the social order by expanding what family means and how members of the family should act. For instance, when Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, her bro and his brothers came to see him, and the crowds are so large that they're just kind of off in the distance, and Jesus says, My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. 
Now we can hear that with like Jesus snark. <laughs> you know, they're so late to the party. They're not my mother and brother anymore. But that goes against everything else we know about him. What he's really saying is all these people are my mother and brother. If they hear the word and they do it, it's just simple, right? So he's not saying they're no longer part of the family. It's the family just got bigger. Elsewhere in Luke, we hear the story of the vineyard workers. It does not matter if they arrived at the close of day or dawn. The wage is the same. Latecomers are in, whether we like it or not. And that, if we are honest with ourselves, it rankles just a little bit. Same with Martha and Mary and the prodigal son. All of these stories show a reordering of what it means to be human and what it means to be generous. This kindling of the fire, which Jesus describes in the beginning, is seen by some as a cataclysmic world-ending event, God's way of confirming our biases against those who are seen as less than and not part of the family of God. So I can't blame anyone for not wanting to think about Jesus bringing fire when we've heard that message in our popular and religious culture in America. Well, he has come to bring fire. He says so. But not to destroy as has been portrayed by some, but to purify and make all things new. What happened at Pentecost? The fire of the Holy Spirit united individuals from every people, language, and nation and gave birth to the church. It didn't burn it all down. And so in the reading, Jesus finishes with their willingness to predict the weather and inability to see the truth of the present moment. Now I read that right there, it's super easy to predict the weather. If you see a cloud here, it's what this means. If you see one there, this is what this means. So they didn't need like super intense weather solving skills to predict the weather. All they're really doing is stating the obvious, right? And we can be that way too. We can attend to weather. We can attend to small talk, things that don't matter, TikTok, whatever. But what we struggle with is attending to Jesus' teachings, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Luke's audience was the early church. The temple had been destroyed. Followers of Christ were being persecuted. Families were becoming divided as certain family members went with the Jesus crowd and certain family members didn't. They were dealing with actual division in the household that way. But what we do have in common with them is that the world just didn't make much sense. However, as Jesus says many times in the New Testament, there is no need to fret about the end times. Just no need to fret. And how does he say that? Well, it'll be like the thief who comes in. It'll be like this. He gives all these examples that contradict each other. He doesn't say, it will be this. It's his Jesus way of saying, just quit worrying about these things that are not in your control. But get out there and do the things that are. It is the present moment that concerns us. God has everything taken care of. And so we ask ourselves, are we preparing the soil of others so that the gospel seed may grow? Are we generous without count counting the cost, as Christ is generous with us? Are we okay when living into the gospel creates tension? Are we okay with that? Do we do all the things we said we would do when we renewed our baptismal covenant last Sunday, seeking and serving Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves? In all things, everything in our life, every moment, Jesus stands at the door and knocks, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And the last word is endurance. He who endured all to run and win the race waits for us to shed our doubts and fears and run our race as well. When that line from Hebrews is written, 
people could picture a Greek athletic event in which the runners ran naked, having shed everything, every doubt, every fear, every second guessing, everything that holds us back from just living into the promise and not worrying about what may come. Jesus brought fire, thanks be to God, not to destroy, but to reorder our broken world. 